Good evening. Welcome to the University Church of Christ Wednesday night Bible study for Wednesday, December 28th, 2022. I'm Terrence R. McLean, ministering evangelist of the University Church of Christ. On behalf of the elders, Brother Frank Bonds, Brother Donald Nelson, Brother Greg Shields and their families. On behalf of the deacons, Brother Freddie Gibson and Brother Anthony Slade and their family. And on behalf of myself as the ministering evangelist and my beloved wife, sister Linda McLean and our family, and on behalf of all of the wonderful members of the University Church of Christ, we thank all of you who have tuned in, members of university, members of our sister congregations, and those who are not members of the Church of Christ, but have a desire uh, to learn more about God's holy and divine word. Uh, we are a New Testament church seeking to evangelize, starting with the central core of Greater Cleveland. And we will use our unique gifts and opportunities to engage with the community to bring souls to Jesus, develop and equip them for a 21st century ministry. There are announcements and prayer requests for this evening. Uh, for the members of the University Church of Christ in person Wednesday Bible study, both noon and evening will resume next Wednesday, January 4th, 2023. Again, in-person Wednesday Bible study at noon as well as in the evening will resume next Wednesday, January 4th, 2023. So we will have Bible study at 12 noon for those who aren't able to come in the evening and would like that earlier time. And then at 6.30 p.m. on next Wednesday, we will have our prayer service followed at 7 o'clock p.m. Bible study. So Wednesday, January 4th, 12 noon Bible study. And then at 6.30 that evening, we'll have prayer service and then go in at 7 o'clock p.m. to our Bible study. We will be studying the subject, the greatest of all time. Uh, books are now available and can be picked up on Sunday or can even be picked up before Sunday if you come to the building during office hours. Our in-person Sunday evening worship will resume on Sunday, January 8th, 2023 at 6 o'clock p.m. Again, our in-person Sunday evening worship will resume Sunday, January 8th, 2023 at 6 o'clock p.m. Our next men's training class will be Saturday, January 7th, 2023 at 1030 a.m. We encourage all brothers to attend. Don't forget to bring your handouts from the prior class, which we had in December of this year. Pray for traveling grace for Brother Frank Barnes, one of our elders who will be traveling to Washington, D.C., uh, along with his son and our beloved brother in Christ, Brian. So we pray for traveling grace for them. Continued prayers for Arnold Patterson, Mary Tatum, Teresa Jenkins and family during their time of bereavement. Uh, continued prayers for Sister McLean, Sister Mildred Brown, the Cottingham family, Sister Ruth Wade, Brother Melvin Flowers, Brother George Felix, Sister Patricia Gaines, Brother Willie Blackwell Sr., Sister Carmel Ivory, Sister Emma Brown, and Deanna Roberts of Arkansas. We want to continue to pray for the health and spiritual healing of Sister Nicole Bird. We are pleased to report that her foot has been healing and her diabetic numbers have been going down. Uh, continue to pray for all of those who have lost family members, our sick and shut-in brothers and sisters and their families, and of course, those who are um, uh, ministering to their medical needs. Uh, pray for the entire Church of Christ family, its ministries, our spiritual strength in the Lord, as he continues to use us, his body, to advance his kingdom. Also continue to pray for our leadership here at university and the entire body of Christ all around the world. 
And of course, we also want to pray for all of our government officials, our country, and world leaders. Before we go into our prayer and into our lesson, I have a sad and important announcement. Many of the members of the Churches of Christ throughout this country, around the world, are familiar with Brother Richard A. Rose Sr. And Brother Rose passed from labor to reward on this past Sunday, December 25th, 22, at 5.45 p.m. in Valdosta, Georgia. His preaching ministry and influence undoubtedly benefited the breadth of our nation while he simultaneously served as the located evangelist of the Gray Road Church of Christ in Cincinnati for over 34 years. Brother Rose was a church builder in partnership with the members of the Gray Road Church. They erected the current Gray Road facility, ordained elders and deacons, and he is responsible for the foundation and framework for the ministry that continues today at 4826 Gray Road in Cincinnati, Ohio. In addition to serving the Gray Road Church, he served the local churches in Columbus, Ohio. And until his transition, after he retired from the Gray Road Church, he served with the Eastside Church of Christ in Valdosta, Georgia. We need to continue to remember his, his wife, Sister Everly Rose, and his sons, Richard Rose Jr. and David Rose, arrangements are forthcoming. Uh, we are thankful for Brother Rose's and his family. Uh, many of his brothers were also gospel preachers. And his sister, Sylvia Rose Cobb, wrote Songs of Faith. A great musician once directed the course there at Southwestern Christian College. It's a family uh, his father was also a gospel preacher, a family that's made a great impact for King Jesus in this world. So let's continue to remember uh, Brother Richard Rose's family, the Gray Road Church of Christ, uh, and their excellent uh, evangelist, Dr. Jeremy Flowers, and the current elders, deacons, and members, uh, but also his family, as well as our brotherhood uh, in prayer. With all of that being said, would you bow with me as we go to God in prayer? Gracious and eternal Father, we come in your presence on the, this evening thanking you for all the blessings of life that you've given us. Father, we realize that it's in you we move and live and have our very being. And so, Father, we just want to say thank you. Uh, this is the last Wednesday of 2022. Uh, we realize, Father, there are many who entered this year with us who did not make it through this year. There are many loved ones and brothers and sisters in Christ, family members, who we are missing at our tables. And we realize that it was because of your sovereign will they were called from this life to the next. And that the only reason we're here is simply because of your grace and your, your mercy. And so, Father, we want to say thank you, and we ask you to be with all of our sick and our shut-in members. You've heard all the names that I've read. We ask you to be with all of those who stand in the need of prayer. We ask you to be with those who are still grieving the loss of loved ones, and we ask a special blessing on Sister Everly Rose and her sons, Richard Rose Jr. and David Rose the entire Rose family on the East Side Church there in Valdosta, Georgia, as well as the Gray Road Church family in Cincinnati and our brotherhood at large. We need you to comfort us as the God of all comfort. Father, we pray you would be with all of the leaderships of the congregations of the people of God around the world, especially in Northeast Ohio and especially our elders, our deacons, and myself, as well as the members of the University Church of Christ here in Cleveland. Father, our prayer is that as we prepare to, to move into a new year, as we prepare to move back to a full-time schedule of, of ministry, we ask you for wisdom, guidance, and direction, and ask you to continue to use us mightily 
in your kingdom for your glory, by your grace. Be with us now as we study your word. Father, would you speak through me and may you get the glory. May Jesus be lifted up. May saints of God be encouraged and may those who have not yet obeyed the gospel be touched by the teaching and the preaching of your word. Bless those who are traveling already. Bless those who will be traveling over the next few days, over this holiday season, which you give them safe passage. Uh, we ask a special blessing for Brother uh, Frank Barnes, one of our elders, and his son, Brian, our brothers in Christ. Keep them safe on the highway as they travel. Take them safely to their destination and bring them home safely at the appointed time. Just continue to be with us throughout this study now. Thank you. For Jesus, your son, in his blessed name, we pray and ask it all. Amen. For this last lesson of 2022, I thought that I would do a lesson that will be encouraging and uplifting to especially those of us who are God's children and would plant a seed in the life of those or the heart of those who are in need of salvation. And I want to talk about a fruitful, fruitful life, neither barren nor unfruitful, a fruitful life, neither barren nor unfruitful. And it's taken from 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. And to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brother, brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ is what verse 8 says. Dr. Ralston Mondesi a few years told a story about Alexander the Great when he did a gospel meeting for me in Jacksonville, Florida. And in this story, he put it this way. After a successful military campaign and maneuver, Alexander the Great was known to reward soldiers who performed bravely and punish those who acted with cowardice. On one occasion, while celebrating with his generals, Alexander's guards dragged before him a young soldier. He had been charged with deserting his army post and was now to receive Alexander's sentence. 
The automatic penalty for such a transgression was death. But for some reason only known to himself, Alexander hesitated on this occasion. He looked down at the young soldier prostrate before him and trembling profusely asked that young man a question. Soldier, what is your name? Alexander, said the soldier weakly. Alexander asked this time with anger in his voice, Alexander, that's my name, said the soldier shamefully. And in a flash, Alexander the Great jumped on that man, grabbed him by the head, looked him in the eye and said, Alexander, that's my name. Soldier, today you're going to live. But from this day forward, you must either change your conduct or change your name. I've always loved that story. That's my name. Soldier, today you're going to live. But from this day forward, you must either change your conduct or change your name. Alexander's point was that if a soldier was to share his name, he must also share the ways that were consistent with that leader's reputation and character. And I want to remind us as we end this year and look at, to go into a new year, that the same is true for those of us who profess to be Christians. That those of us who profess to be Christians must demonstrate by our behavior that we are worthy to wear that name. What the world needs is not a new definition of the gospel, but a real demonstration of the power of the gospel that we already have. And that if those of us who are children of God, who are Christians, want to experience the victorious Christian life, if we want to know something of the joys of what it means to be a child of God, if, if we are to know something of the pleasures of the Christian life, the overflowing, bountiful, successful Christian life, we're going to have to increase our knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and imitate in our lives characteristics that are consistent with his nature. Jesus had a personality that attracted men to him. Jesus had charisma. He had unction. His divine nature had its magnetism. In fact, in John chapter 12, verse 32, even though he was prophesying of his crucifixion, Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. According to what Peter writes here in 2 Peter chapter 1, you and I have been invited to share in that magnetic personality and we are partakers of the divine nature. And as we draw closer to Jesus, the more we become like him. And the more intimate the fellowship with him, the greater the transformation in our lives. In theology, we call this process of conforming to the character and the image of Christ sanctification. Peter puts it this way in 2 Peter 1.4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So what is this thing called sanctification? Sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit using the word of Almighty God through the knowledge that we have to produce the character and the qualities of Christ in our lives. 
Sanctification not only means that you have to give up something, it means that you have to take up something. You must not only lay down, but you must load up. And while you have to lay down those qualities that are unlike God, you and I are to take into our character a personality that reflects the transformation into the image of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Or Peter says in 2 Peter 1, 4, we are partakers of the divine nature. Remember, James said this in James chapter 1, verse number 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your, your souls. Now, James was not talking to a bunch of heathens. He was actually talking to Christians. He was talking to the church of Christ in the dispersion. James, why is it that you're telling saved people to receive the word to save their souls? Because it was the word that saved us in the past when we obeyed the gospel of Christ. And it's the word that is saving us in the present as we walk in the light, 1 John 1 and verse 7. And it will be the word of God that saves us in the future. Why? Because the Holy Spirit uses the word to create in us the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So our process of going to heaven involves three things. Call it a spiritual journey. And I hope these slides are showing up. And the first step is involves our justification. And what I mean by that is that justification says in the past, I was saved from the guilt, the condemnation, and the penalty of sin. Romans chapter 3, verse number 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So when we were baptized, we were justified in God's sight. It's the same thing that he writes about in Romans 8 and verse 1, when it says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So when you and I became Christians, when we obeyed the gospel, when we heard it, we believed it, we repented of our sins, we confessed with the mouth that Jesus Christ is God's son, and when we were buried in baptism, we arose a new creation, and God justified us, or when he looked at us at that point, it was just as if we had never sinned. Now, one day we're going to get to the point of what is called glorification. Glorification is in the future. That means one day you and I will be saved from the very presence of sin. Now, in justification, we're saved from the penalty of sin. But in glorification, we will be saved from the very presence of sin. In Romans chapter 8, verse 17 says, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. We will receive a glorified body. We will be glorified with Christ. There will be no sin in his presence. Verse number 30, moreover, whom he did predestinate them, he also called. And whom he called them, he also justified. And whom he justified them, he also glorified. Justification on one end, glorification on the other end. But we still have a problem with the power of sin in this life. That's what sanctification is all about. 
Sanctification is between justification and justification and glorification, and it deals with the power of sin in this life. So Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You often hear me quote this passage of scripture from 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. And so as we look at 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter gives us some practical points on how we can have a wholesome personality, how we can display the image of Christ formed in us so that we can become more Christ-like or more like Christ each and every day of our lives. There are four things that I want to consider from our text. Number one, I want to talk about a fact that needs to be believed. And then number two, a command that needs to be obeyed. Number three, a promise that needs to be received. And then number four, a warning that needs to be heeded. So number one, a fact that needs to be believed. Number two, a command that needs to be obeyed. Number three, a promise that needs to be received. And number four, a warning that needs to be heeded. So what is the fact that needs to be believed? In 2 Peter 1 verse 5, Peter says, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. The fact that Peter wants us to believe, the fact that forms the foundation for our Christian growth and development is the fact of faith. As Christians, obedient faith is what got us into Christ. Faith is man's response to God's grace. Therefore, faith is the foundation of the Christian life. And all the other Christian graces practically must be built upon our faith and our confidence in God. So when we walk with the Lord, faith is not simply the first step, but faith is every step. According to Romans 1.17, the Christian life is from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So beginning from your inception by spiritual conception to the consummation of eternal coronation, the only indispensable ingredient and imperative ingredient for fruitfulness in the Christian life is your trust and confidence in Almighty God. Salvation is impossible without faith, John 3, 18. Pleasing God is impossible without faith, Hebrews eleven six. 6. Victory over the world is an impossibility without faith, 1 John 5 and verse 4. Prayer is not heard by God if not accompanied by faith, James 1 and verse 6. Real joy is not possible without faith, 1 Peter 1, verse 8. And Romans 14, 23 says, whatever does not spring from faith is sin. So Peter, what are you saying to us as we try to imitate in our lives the character of Jesus Christ? Peter is simply saying to us that the Christian life begins in faith, it continues in faith, it grows in faith, it is perfected in faith, and it ends in faith. Faith is the foundation for the Christian life. And the fact that faith is the foundation for the Christian life, upon this fact, we are to build all these other graces into our lives. Faith is a fact that does not need to be explained. It simply needs to be believed. And the only qualifying attribute that you need to hang your picture along, heaven's hall of fame, 
is faith in Almighty God and faith in Jesus Christ. Notice Peter says, and beside this giving all diligence, add. This word add has an interesting background. It comes from a word that means one who provides supplies. Literally, it refers to that leader or sponsor of a choir or chorus who furnished the chorus itself and the expenses that went along with putting on that particular chorus. So in the days of the Apostle Peter, Creek productions were a delight to the audience. And when a writer was finished writing a play, he would go to the mayor of the city and request that the mayor provide a choir or a chorus so that they could put into song the composition he originated. The mayor, in turn, would go to someone who was wealthy in that community and would request that that person sponsor the choir. That person would choose a trainer for the choir, would select the choir, and would provide all the necessities for that choir. And at the appropriate time, the choir would render the composition composed by the writer to the delight of the public and to the glory of the, quote, gods with a little g, unquote, of Greece. So what's going on here? Peter is picturing God with a capital G as the divine composer. Verses two through four of, again, 2 Peter 1, set out before us the great composition of God. God tells us that the composition has to do with his love for us and tells us that we are to provide the choir director. We need to provide the choir. We need to take the production that he has made and make that production sound good so that others will listen to it and glorify God. Peter says, when you have all these qualities in your life, when you have faith as the director, when you have faith as the leader, then with faith, you have these choir members, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity or love. When all of these choir members are part of your composition, heard by others, then your life is going to sing the sweet harmonious songs of the praises of Jesus Christ. And if any one of these choir members is missing, your life will be out of tune. God says, I have written my composition. It's the gospel of Christ. I want you to get some faith, gather these choir members, demonstrate to the world my composition in your life. By our lives, we are to sing the praises of the Lamb. By our lives, we are to be singing the sweet songs of God and making a positive impression on those around us because our personalities are being conformed to the image of his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Romans chapter 8, verse number 29 reads this way, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God wants you and I to look more like Jesus and less like our natural selves. Faith is the leader. Hire faith and let faith organize virtue. Let faith train virtue. Let faith conduct virtue. Put them all together and see what a beautiful life you're going to have. So that brings us to this command that we need to obey. Peter says, add to your faith. Faith without having anything added to it is stagnant and stunted. Faith without activity, faith without increase, faith without fruit becomes stale and unproductive. 
you know, if a room doesn't have air circulating in it and the fresh air goes out, it becomes stale. Water, if it's not running, if it's left standing, it becomes putrid. Faith is like that. It doesn't stop or stand still when we are born again. Birth is just the beginning. You got to grow up. Faith is simply the chorus leader. Faith is not the whole choir. And so in order for God's composition in our lives to be rendered in a way that the rest of the world will sing his praises, we've got to add some choir members to our faith. The first choir member that we've got to add is virtue. And this Greek, this word virtue comes from the Greek word aratai. And it gets its name from the Roman god of war. It means manly courage or moral excellence. And it embodies the idea of force, power, and energy. In today's terminology, virtue is the ability or the moral courage to do what one knows is right. It is conviction that is verbalized, visualized, and actualized. And if you're honest with yourself, you know that we live in loose lacks and lustful days. And so we need men and women of God with moral courage and moral integrity that will stand up and live out in their lives what they believe to be true. It's not easy to say no when everybody else is saying yes. It's not easy to live right when everybody else is living wrong. And therefore, after we've developed faith, we must have some moral integrity or some manly courage to stand up and to live up to those facts that we hold to be true. We need some men in the church. We need some women in the church with some virtue. Jesus Christ was a manly man. He was a man's man. He was no wimp. The Bible tells us that what we need in the church is some people who have the courage and morality to stand up for their convictions. It was John Wesley who said, give me a hundred men who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. And I'll shake this world. If you want to find yourself with a Christ-like spirit, develop manly courage, have some moral integrity, stand up for what you know to be right. One of the reasons that sin runs rampant and unconfronted in the church is because very few are willing to stand up and call sin by its name. But after we've added virtue, we need to add some knowledge. That translates the Greek word gnosis, and it has reference to full knowledge or knowledge that is growing. It's having a keen sense or insight into what is right or wrong in the world. It refers to the ability to handle life successfully. This knowledge comes from obedience to the will of God. It's the opposite of being so heavenly minded as to be of no earthly good. This kind of knowledge does not come automatically. It comes from obedience to the will of God. It has reference to what Jesus declared in John chapter 7 and verse 17. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. As Christians, we are called upon to grow wiser as we grow older. Every day ought to involve a connection or a correction of the mistakes that we made yesterday. We should gain strength from our weaknesses, firmness from our failings. So we should add virtue, we should add knowledge. The next thing he says we ought to add, this choir member, is we ought to add some temperance comes from a Greek word, enkratia, which means to hold oneself under or to rule oneself with a strong hand. 
It conveys the idea of self-mastery, self-control, or self-government. The wise man Solomon had much to say about temperance. In Proverbs 16 and verse 32, he says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. He goes on and writes in Proverbs 25 and verse 28, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. So this idea of temperance conveys the idea of one being able to master one's appetites, to master one's passions, to master one's longing. Because of the attacks of the devil and because of the allurements of sin, because of the attraction of the world and the appeal of the flesh, we've got to put guards at every door of our souls. Why is that, Brother McLean? Because the devil usually comes in at those doors that we leave unguarded and unlocked. Let me see if I can demonstrate this with a story about a man that said, I'm always tired. And it goes this way. Once an old man said to a friend, man, I'm always tired. The friend looked at him in amazement and asked, how come you're always tired? The old man replied, listen, it's because I have two falcons to tame, two rabbits to keep from running away, two hawks to manage, a serpent to confine, a lion to keep caged, and a sick man to wait on and take care of. The friend looked at him and asked, how in the world are you doing all that? And the old man answered, the two falcons are my eyes, which I must guide lest they look at things they must not look at. The rabbits are my feet, which I must constantly restrain lest they run in the devil's way. The two hawks are my hands, which I must keep and work for my sake and my brethren's sake. That serpent is my tongue, which I must always watch over lest I speak things which I ought not. That lion is my heart, which I must continually struggle with lest vanity enters it and hinders the operation of Almighty God. That sick man is my body, and I must needs watch over him, man, I'm tired. Indeed, it is a continuous job trying to control your passions. And the greatest enemy is the enemy within our own bosoms. Peter says, by the power of the Holy Spirit in us, we must exercise self-control. And then the next choir member is patience. And one might think that the word patience is the same as temperance, but not quite. It comes from the Greek word hupomone, and it literally means an abiding under. Hupo meaning under, meno meaning to abide. And this is not the patience that you and I think about when we say, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. This word literally means an abiding under. And what it means is having the ability to endure when the circumstances of life are difficult. Self-control has to do with handling the pleasures of life while patience relates primarily to the pressures of the problems of life. The ability to endure problem people is considered long suffering. Often the person who gives in to pleasures is not disciplined enough to handle pressures either. So he or she gives up. Patience is the ability to endure hardships without cracking up or caving in. 
most of us have the type of personalities that just can't stand the heat. And there's nothing that reveals the nature of a man or a woman like that which puts some fire under them. And when you put some fire under him or her, what comes out is what was inside all the time. Temperance deals with our passions and our pleasures. Patience deals with our problems. In other words, we have to remain calm even in the midst of crisis. It deals with how we are handling the conflicts and troubles that come into our lives. After we've developed temperance, after we've learned to control those pleasures and passions, let's see how we do when we have problems in our lives. If you want to see some people question God, give them some pressure. If you want to see some people run away from the church, give them some pressure. If you want to see some people leave the Lord, just light a fire under them and they crack up, they cave in. Statistics say that one in every four families in America has someone who will need psychiatric help. Brothers and sisters, we've got to understand that difficulties are going to come in our lives. The dark clouds are going to overshadow and the rains are going to fall. It's not a matter of if, but it's just a matter of when because they're going to come. And how are you going to handle the problems that inevitably come your way? Patience is not something that develops automatically. We must work at it. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 8, give us the right approach. We must expect trials because without trials, we could never learn patience. We must, by faith, let our trials work for us and not against us. Because we know that God is at work in our trials. If we need wisdom in making decisions, God will grant that wisdom if we ask him. Nobody enjoys trials. But we do enjoy the confidence we can have in trials that God is at work. Causing everything to work together for our good and his glory, according to Romans chapter 3, verse number 28. Very quickly, I want to read to you what he says in Hebrew, in James chapter 1, verse 2 through 8. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have a perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, and nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Even though we don't enjoy the trials, we do enjoy the confidence we can have in trials that God is at work, causing everything to work together for our good and for his, his glory. The next choir member he talks about is godliness. That word godliness literally means God-likeness. And in the original Greek, this word meant to worship well. It described the man or the woman who was right in their relationship with God. Perhaps the words reverence and piety come closer to defining this term. It is that quality of character that makes a person distinctive. He or she lives above the petty things of life, the passions and pressures that control the lives of others. He or she seeks to do the will of God, and he or she does seek the welfare 
of others. We must never get the idea that godliness is an impractical thing. Because it's intensely practical. The godly person makes the kinds of decisions that are right and noble. They do not take an easy path simply to avoid either pain or trial. They do what is right because it is right and because it is the will of God. When we observe the requirements of God, then we are right in our relationship with God. And when we observe the requirements of God, then we behave God-like. If you want to be God-like, then simply observe the commandments of God. Do what he says to do in order to be saved. Hear the gospel, believe the gospel, repent of your sins, confess with the mouth, Jesus Christ is God's son, and then be buried in water for the remission of sins. And then walk in the light as a child of God, worship God in spirit and in truth, John 4, 23 and 24. Do your best to live holy, H-O-L-Y, as God has commanded us to do. But then there's another choir member that we need to add, and it's called brotherly kindness in the King James Version. It literally means to love your brother. It literally means fond of one's brethren or loving as brethren. In the Greek, it's phileo and avaphos, from which we get the city, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. If we love Jesus Christ, as we claim we do, we must also love the brethren. 1 John 3, verse 14. Uh, brothers and sisters, it, it's not optional. If we love Jesus Christ, we also must love the brethren. 1 John 3, 14 says, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, that we should practice an unfeigned or sincere love of the brethren. That means we don't just pretend that we love our brothers and sisters. We don't pretend on Sunday knowing that we can't stand them the rest of the week. Amen, lights. The Hebrew writer wrote in Hebrews 13, 1, let brotherly love continue. Paul wrote in Romans 12, verse 10, be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, the fact that we love our brothers and sisters in Christ is one evidence that we have been born of God. Notice that brotherly kindness is next to godliness and not cleanliness. You've all heard the saying, cleanliness is next to godliness. By the way, that's nowhere in anybody's Bible. But brotherly love is there. Godliness is not solitary. Godliness, when it comes to brotherly kindness, is sociable. A man or a woman who loves and obeys God will love the other man or woman who loves and obeys God also. A religion that reaches up to God must also be a religion that reaches out to one another. When you are near to God and when I am near to God, then both of us are near to each other in fellowship. A religion that allows you to low grade, a religion that allows you to degrade, a religion that allows you to berate your brothers and sisters is not Christian in nature. We need to be kin in a brotherly way. And we need to understand the necessity of our relationship to each other in Jesus Christ. 
You cannot find holiness in a hole. A lot of people talk about a churchless Christianity, but I want you to understand that if you are right with God, you're going to live your right relationship with God in the Christ community, the church. God expects you to be kind to your brothers and sisters in Christ. God expects you to be a sociable individual. He expects you to learn how to get along with one another. That's why the Apostle Paul says that we are to forbear one another in love, Ephesians 4 and verse 2. In Colossians 3.13, he wrote, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. If you're right with God, you're going to live your right relationship with God in the Christian community, the church of Christ, the body of Christ. But there's one more choir member, the last choir member. Now, remember, we're talking about brotherly love here. But here comes another word, charity or agape love. This is the love that is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We must have the sacrificial love that our Lord displayed when he went to the cross. The kind of love that God shows toward lost sinners. It's the kind of love described in 1 Corinthians 13. It's the love that the Holy Spirit produces in our hearts as we walk in the Spirit. In Romans chapter 5, verse number 5. Romans chapter 5, verse number and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. In Galatians chapter 5, and we're all familiar with that passage of scripture because it gives us what we call the fruit of the Spirit. And it says in verse number 22, but the fruit of the spirit is very first one is love, agape, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So even these things that Peter talks about that we ought to have as a part of our personalities they can only come from the spirit working within us. We can't grunt them into existence. When we have brotherly love, we love because of our likenesses to others. But with agape love, we love in spite of the differences we have. It is impossible for fallen human nature to manufacture these seven qualities of Christian character. They must be produced by the Spirit of God. And to be sure, there are unsaved people who possess amazing self-control and endurance. But these virtues point to them and not to the Lord. They get the glory. When God produces the beautiful nature of his son in a Christian, it is God who receives the praise and glory. Because we have the divine nature, we can grow spiritually and develop this kind of Christian character. It is through the power of God and precious promises of God that this growth takes place. The divine genetic structure is already there. As I read already in Romans 8, verse number 29, God wants us to be conformed to the image of his son. The life within will reproduce that image if we but diligently cooperate with God and use the means he has lavishly given us. 
the Bible tells us that if we inculcate every one of these graces in our lives, when we walk down the street, we can conform to the image of Christ and we are partakers of the divine nature. And then the third point is there is a promise to be received. Notice this man, he's given all diligence to add to faith, virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience, to patience, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. He's right in his relationship with God, treats his brothers and sisters right, and he treats people in the world right. Isn't that a magnetic personality? Peter goes on to give us a promise in verse 8. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though Christian character is an end in itself, it is also a means to an end. The more we become like Jesus Christ, the more the Spirit can use us in the service of our King. The Christian who is not growing is idle or barren and unfruitful. The word translated barren means ineffective. The people who fail to grow usually fail in everything else. Some of the most effective Christians are people without dramatic talents and special abilities or even exciting personalities. Yet God has used them in a marvelous way. Why? Because they are becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. They have the kind of character and conduct that God can trust with blessing. They are fruitful because they are faithful. They are effective because they are growing in their Christian experience. Why does God use them? Because they have the kind of character and conduct that God can trust with blessing. They're effective because they're growing. They're fruitful because they're faithful. And then the warning that we need to heed, and I'm closing the lesson. Verse 9 says, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. And hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. You can afford to lack a lot of things in life. But don't lack these seven graces. Why is that? Because the Bible says there are two things fatally wrong with a man or with a woman that lacks these qualities. If you are a child of God and you lack these qualities, you are terminally ill with two diseases that will take you to the grave. Number one, you have spiritual myopia. You're blind. And then number two, you have spiritual amnesia. You forget what God has done for you. You are short-sighted and you have a short memory. That's what the Bible says. We need to have these qualities in our lives so that we can attract others to the Christ they see in us. Too often we have dead preachers preaching dead sermons to dead people in a dead church. And the only way they can be revived is to guide them to be conformed to the image of Christ. We need fewer organizers for prayer and more agonizers in prayer. We need fewer singers and more clingers. We need fewer strayers and more stayers. We need less fashion and more passion. We need more gospel preachers and fewer gossip seekers. 
if we're conformed to the image of Christ, if we have these seven graces, these seven qualities, we won't have any problem winning other people to Christ. A few years ago, Dale Carnegie wrote a book entitled How to Win Friends and Influence People. Well, tonight, I can go one better than that. Do you want to know how to lose friends and alienate people? Just don't possess these qualities in your life. And nobody's going to want to be around you. Especially if you claim to be a Christian. That's our last lesson on a Wednesday in 2022. And I pray that this will kind of catapult you into 2023 as a child of God. And you take advantage of this opportunity to return to the bishop of your soul if you have fallen away so you can make your calling and election sure. If you're not a child of God, then you can't even start adding anything until you get the faith that's the choir to direct it. Because you must hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the gospel according to 1 Corinthians 15, one through four, is the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day according to the scriptures for our sins. You must believe that gospel that's what faith is. And Jesus said in John 8, 24, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And where I am, you cannot come. You must repent of your sins, change your mind, change your actions. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, I tell your neighbor, except ye repent, you shall all likewise perish. Confess with the mouth, Jesus Christ is God's son. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my father, which is in heaven. Whosoever therefore shall deny me before men, him will I deny before my father, which is in heaven. You need to confess the sweetest name on mortal tongue. And then be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. After Peter preached that first gospel sermon on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ in Acts chapter 2. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter answered and said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So you must be baptized. Galatians 3, 26 and 27 says it puts you into Christ. It makes you a child of God. So if you're not a child of God, call us, hopefully, our telephone number, our website is showing up, our email address is showing up. Call us, even if you don't live in the area, we will help you find someone to help you in 2022 and go into 2023 as a child of God. And if you are a child of God and you have strayed away, why don't you come back home? God is standing, waiting with open arms to receive you unto himself. And if you're a child of God and you just simply got weak, your hands are hanging down, I want you to lift up your head. We're going to continue to pray for you, pray for one another, pray with one another. We're going to pray for lost souls that they might be saved. Thank you for joining me in this study. And if you're a child of God, a Christian, remember to do something that only a Christian would do. And whether you're a Christian or not, Remember, God loves you. Jesus died for you. I love you, and I am your servant for Jesus' sake. And I always say that I, but I really can say we, because that includes my beloved wife, Sister Linda McLean. So we say to all of our congregation, University Church family, to all of our brothers and sisters in Christ in Northeast Ohio and Greater Cleveland, in Ohio, around the country, and around world. We love you. And Sister McLean and I say to those who may be lost in sin, we love you as well. And we want you to accept God's love through obeying the gospel. We want you to have a safe end of the year and a happy and prosperous new year. Pray with me.
All wise and all merciful Father who art in heaven, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to once again teach your word. And my prayer is that you have been pleased with the lesson on tonight. And that whenever the persons watch it on Facebook, maybe they watched it live. Maybe they're watching it later. Maybe they're watching it on YouTube. Maybe they're on the teleconference call. However, they are having access to this lesson. I'm asking you to use it as an instrument for the saving of lost souls and the edification of saints. We pray that you've gotten glory, that Jesus has been lifted up, that saints of God have been edified. Lost souls have had the word planted in their hearts, not only in this lesson, but throughout all the lessons and sermons of this year. Thank you so much for your grace and mercy. Be with the Rose family and the passing of Brother Richard Rose. Comfort them as the God of all comfort. Comfort the Gray Road Church of Christ family as well as the East Side Church of Christ family there in Valdosta where he went to retire and served you continuously until his transition. Be with others who are grieving the loss of loved ones, whether recent or in the past because we still need your comfort. Watch over, protect, and keep us as we leave this platform. In Jesus' blessed name we pray and ask it all. Amen.